News 46. Local coverage you can count on. Simplify. I'm your host, Mark Bonstein, or as I was commonly referred to as Staff Sergeant B. We'll get to my guest in one second, but first, we're going to see what happened in history this day. <sighs> first day with new lips, I'm still breaking them in. September 1st, in the Air Force in 1942, established one of the Air Force Pacific Fleet VADM, Andrew F. W. F. Flitch, USN. So I guess the Air Force was starting to come into their own on that one. For a change, we got something on the Coast Guard. I very rarely get the uh, Coast Guard. 1942, the Coast Guard transferred responsibility for running the Merchant Marine Training Program to the War Shipping Administration. Very rare when I get them. And in the Army in 1945, General MacArthur ends his military rule, which has been his and has forced since the American landing on Leyte because the Philippine government had reestablished its functions, normally control of all areas of the Commonwealth. And in 1950, in the Navy, Lieutenant Eugene F. Clark was put ashore at Hangdong Do to command an operation to gather intelligence for the M. Paling Amphibious Assault at Inchon. And last but not least, the Marines finally come back. Because they took a break last week. In 1969, 1st Marine Regiment was presented the Presidential Unit Citation for the operation of Way City in Vietnam. So without further ado, my guest was a Corporal in the Marines, Terry Rivella. Welcome to Semperfy. Did I say that right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Welcome to Semperfy. Thank you. All right. Give us a little background about yourself, where you're from. Uh, well, I'm from uh, Staten Island, New York, originally. And I uh, finished high school up in Warwick, New York. And uh, August of, uh, well, actually, July of uh, 1970, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Two, two weeks later, August 3rd, I was at Paris Island, South Carolina, as a 140-pound weakling um, kid. Uh, right off the bus at three in the morning onto the yellow footprints. Isn't that a lot of fun? <laughs> it brings back memories. <laughs> I was scared to death. Uh, I'm saying to myself, God, what did I get into? I think you we know, all said that when we got off the uh, bus. <laughs> uh, you know, you have this real sharp uh, assistant drill instructor, you know, sharp as can be, shaped like a V, uh, you know, six foot, mean as a dog barking at you like you have 30 minutes to 30 seconds to get off this bus and you just wasted 15 of them yeah <laughs> you know so it's it's it, 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 when you look back it's funny when you're there it's not, yeah, it's funny. not funny yeah, yeah. i remember yeah. when our bus was coming slowly around all the turns yeah you know the bus driver turned the lights on and it uh, was a private uh, walking guard right the yep. vest and, yep. the, and somebody's yelling what's he doing and the bus driver's yelling is to shut up but you know yeah. the fear of the unknown i think right. is what they mainly why they right. bring us in at zero dark 30. right yeah so, uh, you went in 1970. Yes. So how was boot camp then from 77? I don't know. How much did you get hit around? Well, <laughs> I, I was one of the only two guys in my whole platoon that had a high school diploma, so I was the, ad, I was the admin scribe. <laughs> back then it was different, you know, it was all different times. It, you know, today the Marines are a lot smarter, a lot sharper. Back then, we were just full of uh, blood and guts, you know? and. Uh, I was the admin scribe, so I did all the paperwork, you know, house mouse, you know. Uh, so I actually uh, got PFC at a, at a boot camp. But um, I had to hit the drill instructor's house a couple of times for uh, motivation. Did it? Uh, yeah, for laughing on the red line with the red book. And uh, <laughs> I got caught. <laughs> it's me and another, another recruit who became a good friend of mine, Bobby Rose. And uh, I didn't know the... Uh, assistant drill instructor was behind me when it happened so the senior drill instructor you know had me at his house so i never did that again so 
That was a lot of fun. Okay, in 77, I had two private, we had two privates in our platoon that was given the option of jail or boot camp. How many did you have? Uh, probably out of 88 of us that started, probably 68. <laughs> That's a fact. We had one guy that was trying to steal a helicopter. Really? I don't, <laughs> uh, a lot of our guys that, that had that were like petty crimes. A lot from Chicago, New York area. I'm from, you know, New York. And it was a lot of uh, young 17, 18-year-olds that, you know, went for a joyride in a car, you know, grabbed theft, uh, or, you know, stole something out of a store, you know, grabbed, you know, snatched Misdemeanor grabbed, stuff. Misdemeanor yeah. stuff. And... and <clears throat> A lot of them had one parent generally. Um, sometimes they would have both, and and they would recommend to the judge, you know, he needs some discipline. You know, he needs a uh, person needed supervision. So, um, a lot of the judges, I don't know why they just said the military, but all these guys wind up in the Corps. I mean, you know, I don't know why they don't go to the Air Force and come to the Coast Guard and Navy. But but I'll tell you, they were some of the most tenacious uh, fighters I ever met in my life. Just very strong, courageous. Uh, people you know just really good guys i miss them yeah uh, i don't only keep in touch with one guy that i was in the, the mm -hmm. core with name is eddie wilson lives in georgia mm -hmm. and he found me by accident over at the leatherneck club in georgia he was looking through the book and ran into my name cut me a letter and says do i remember you and i wrote him six pages saying you idiot you and i were roommates in fssg we were wow. the same barracks you moron <laughs> so when i called him an idiot and a moron he told his wife yeah that's, that's him <laughs> Yeah, I actually, you know, it's such a small world. I, 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 I started out uh, 35, 31 at Lejeune. I was a Moto T. And then because I had gotten a secret clearance, they transferred me over to 25, 31. So I said, you know, I went to New River Station in Moffitt Point for school. And I went through the schooling. Um, and then we got activated as part of Task Force Delta. I was in a 2-8. So Task Force Delta went over to replace... Uh, Task Force Charlie over in Vietnam in Da Nang. Okay. And it was only a seven and a half month tour, so it was a real <laughs> short tour, but you were had an air wing with you and all. And I come to find out we're talking about toys for tots upstairs in the Marine Corps League room, and Colonel Pollitt says, I was bombing Way City from the Perfume River where you guys were blowing the river bridge. <laughs> and I was like, really? And we're talking code names. And, you know, back then you had to two uh, channel uh, radio for the, you know, the prick tents, and you got your codes every 12 hours. And, um, just such a small world to hear that, you know, and I said, no, you're kidding me. He goes, no, nah, I was in the EFS 233, you know, and uh, it, you, you don't realize how small it really is. So I did seven and a half months there. I came back, went back to Lejeune. Where in Lejeune did you go this time? I, I went back to uh, Cherry Point. Okay. And uh, and then I was in the main side at, at uh, Motor T at, at Cherry. So, I so did they Motor put you T. back to Motor T after? I went back to Motor T after radio. Why did they do that? Why didn't they keep you at the well, other? Well, here's place? the deal, because what happens <laughs> when I finally get out, I go back home to New York, and I get a call from from uh, <clears throat> Gunny Sergeant out of uh, New Rochelle, New York, 90 Buford Avenue. It's a Camo Motor T uh, unit, reserve unit. Okay. They said, uh, I says, you know, I got out in 73. And uh, it was like one month they get this call. He says, uh, Corporal Valley, you're UA. I said, excuse me, sir, I'm discharged. He goes, no, you're UA. you got to come down to a meeting. So, you know, I, I'm just out like a month or so. So I, you know, panic. I get in my car. I go down to New Rochelle. I find out where it is. It's right by the main part of the city. All right. You know, it's got the old uh, round <clears throat> gymnasium type style, you know, headquarters. So I go in there and I see the gunny sergeant. He says, uh, you know, you got to sign this document because you're UA. So I signed the document. He goes, welcome to three years in the active reserves. <laughs> <laughs> so I did three years there and I was driving a combo trucks. <laughs> okay, so after you signed up there, yeah. did they drop the UA charge? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, they, they, <laughs> yeah they, they, see, it's how you were they didn't go. They didn't go through that because I was like, you know, I'm thinking office hours and I'm like, I'm in trouble, you know. Going to lose a stripe. Just lose a stripe. And I'm like... You know, so I panicked. I flew down. It was like an hour and ten minutes from where I was living at the time. But I get down there and uh, I sign a paper. And next thing I know, it's welcome. And I'm like, Phew. I didn't care. As long as I didn't get office hours and stuff, you know, I didn't, I, you know, because I figured I'm gonna go to break or something, you know. He must have a been kid. a recruiter. Yeah, I, I was a kid, you know. And it was funny because, uh, uh, because the uh, master sergeant. Who was in the next room was laughing like crazy, you know, because he's, you know, I'm 19 years old, you know, <laughs> and, he's, <laughs> and he's laughing at this guy. And he goes, oh, got another one, huh? <laughs> Taking advantage of you. Jeez, that's something. Yeah. 
Oh. And, but they disbanded that, and they went to uh, Long Island, I think. They're a Long Island unit now. But it was a good unit. I had a lot of fun there. We did a, a summer cruise down to Cuba and stuff. And, what uh, would you do there? Uh, just a deployment down there. Just, just a, a ship offload. Ship offload and, off load and reload them back. Yeah, that's Two-week tour. On, LST. You yeah, know. That's what we did in Kuwait. Yeah. Went there, offloaded all the vehicles, yeah. and brought them back brought on them the back USS on. Uh, Jefferson or Johnson. It was named after a Medal of Honor, oh, honor okay. a recipient. The, the ship was... <clears throat> PFC Johnson, I think it was. So, how long are you out there doing that for? Just a week, a month? Well, two weeks. That two was weeks? our two-week cruise. It was uh, two days of planning, cruise, two days coming back, debrief. So, it was a lot of fun, except when we hit rough waters in an LST. I don't know how many Marines ever been in an LST, though, but when them screws come out of the water, that whole boat shakes, and it <laughs> shakes violently. And I'll tell you, I was sick for like a day and a half in a hole, man. I was, I was a baby, you know. I... <laughs> That's why I was on the. That's why I joined the Marines. I didn't want to be a sea dog. I was a land lover. And, and I, didn't, I didn't do any of that until I went in that reserve unit. Really? Yeah. My whole three years active, I never did that. You know, I flew. We went to Nam. We came back. We went through, you know, Guam, and we went through uh, the stumps and back to Lejeune. Never that. I was like, wow. When you were in Lejeune, you ever hit swoop circle? Yep. I was one of the drivers. <laughs> and if you were late. Too bad. Too bad. And I had your 10 bucks, you know? But yeah, we got stopped. There was eight of us one time, and we didn't have time to change, so we were in our utilities. So we're, we're going northbound. We get stopped outside of Virginia. I get a ticket from a uh, Virginia trooper for speeding. So we get to the Port Authority building. Everybody jumps out, right? Um, so we're coming back, and two of the guys forgot to change. So when we get back to the gate, they get jammed up. We get jammed up because they found out we were out of bounds. Because back then you had an out of bounds area. We used to have to carry our orders right, on our wallet. Right, right. So we got jammed up for that. So that was my first uh, office hours, and that was two weeks of mess and maintenance. Ooh, yeah. you worked it off, or yeah. they still charged you? No, I worked it off. I worked it off back then. They, they, they were a lot they, more lenient then. Yeah, they, they actually gave yeah. you a reason to keep your right your yeah. SRB somewhat yeah. clean. Oh yeah, they, they. As a matter of <laughs> fact, there was quite a few guys that that happened to, especially for minor violations like that. They would let you work it off. If you were squared away and it was your first offense, other yeah. than that, forget about it. They would put you through the ringer. You know? yeah. It was, yeah, it depends who you had. Our, yeah. you know, our company, Gunny, he was an old sea dog. Uh, Gunny Scogsdale was his name. He he was kind of like that. He would bitch you out and make you do things to, you know, make peace with him. Right. So he was the company Gunny. That's the way he did it. Um, yeah, a lot of our a lot of our NCOs were Korean vets and early non vets. Yeah, we had a lot of guys. 59, that were. 60, 61. Yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> even in boot camp, what do you want to do, sir? It kills. Where are you going to Nam, sir? Where, you know, that was their motivation the whole time. And they all did time there, you know, so yeah. you had a lot of respect for them. Well, and, we had a lot of our guys that had those uh, ribbons. They were uh, all, a lot of my guys were all, uh, senior people were all uh, Vietnam vets. Uh, well, we're going to take a quick break. So we'll get a cup of coffee and we'll be right back. All right. Welcome to Semper Fi. We're talking to my host, who was a uh, corporal in the Marines, Terry Ravella. So we just got done talking about uh, you finishing up over in Camp Lejeune with Swoop Circle and <laughs> had a lot of fun. I did that once, and after, if you weren't there, you were high and dry. Uh, and when they had to stop, and if you had to go to the head, it was wait till we get gas. And right. I got tired of that real quick, plus having everybody sleeping and drooling on you in the car <laughs> so <laughs> i was always the driver so i had that problem no but i did have guys with their heads on me and stuff because you pack six seven eight guys in a car yeah. and it was a 69 plymouth van so hey. you couldn't kill that car but it was fun <laughs> you couldn't kill fun. the car yeah, the cars were made good back then yeah. all right so now these days what do you find yourself doing well um in 1976 when i left the the uh, active reserves um I took a test for the New York State uh, DEC police and uh, joined them and 
uh, started a state police career with New York State. It's an elite group of uh, 300 out of the state police that actually do all kinds of environmental enforcement, hazmat, truck enforcement, highway enforcement. Uh, it's like a 350-man special unit. Snowmobiling, ATVs, uh, motorboat patrol, you know, uh, uh, harbor patrol. Wow. Yeah, so it was a lot, right. of, a lot of fun. Yeah, it was, a good, it was really uh, good. So I rose up the ranks and uh, uh, became a captain. And captains and that are chiefs under civil service law, but we're actually a commander of a zone. Um, so we cover some 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 commanders cover seven or eight counties in New York, and I had um, seven counties upstate. And then when I got promoted to lieutenant, I went to the city. I was in charge of two of the five counties. Then when I made captain in 1998, I was in charge of the whole city of New York for the state. <clears throat> and um, I did uh, hazmat enforcement, explosions, truck enforcement, emissions, uh, organized crime work. Uh, we did the Fulton Fish Market. Oh. Uh, we did Hunts Point with the trucks and products coming in for well, you safety. You wore a lot of hats. Yeah. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, we went to every f major fire explosion for investigative purposes because we, uh, along with the state fire service for cause and origin, if there was chemicals involved, we were responsible for mitigation and enforcement of that. So if somebody used a chemical to start a fire and someone died, we would bring the murder charge or the manslaughter charge. Um, same thing if it was a car accident with a tractor trailer and a tractor trailer was saying doing 70 or 80 and hit a car and exploded, we would charge the company with reckless endangerment and a vehicular manslaughter in New York. New York laws are very different than Nevada. <clears throat> they sound very strange. Uh, very, very strange. All right. And then we would enforce all the gun laws in New York. The DEC is responsible. Oh, I, I hear everybody gets denied for a CCW out there without yeah, the it's hesitation. It's crazy. You could smoke marijuana, and the, and the most a cop can do is give you a ticket for fifty dollars. Can't even put you in handcuffs, but you can't carry a gun as a citizen. It's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. That would be the wild west out there. That's why. Yeah. You know well, as well as I do. Sixteen million people. <laughs> you know. So, uh, update, and what I wanted to get into is the trade center. <clears throat> On the morning of September 11th, I was the commander for the state for New York City for the state uh, agency and uh, when the first plane hit I was actually on the city line and got the radio transmission from my desk officer that a plane had hit the Trade Center so I immediately called Albany headquarters and spoke to the colonel and the superintendent and the major and I explained to them what was going on and it, it did, this didn't dawn on me till months later but I know that they said to me be careful there's more planes inbound when we're, we're under a terrorist attack we had already gotten a call from Washington as soon All as right. the first plane hit. So I'm lights and siren down the West Side Highway, and I'm just I'm going to be brief because I want to get into what we're doing here. Right. Um, I get to the Trade Center with one of my troops, and all my other troops are mustering in the areas around the Trade Center, but not directly in. So Je uh, Jeff Cox and I we go into the first North Tower, and we see one of the commanders there. I don't know from OEM, Calvin Drayton, and he said. You know, get as many people, get on the phone to Albany. We need all the help we can get. <clears throat> I know that uh, the chief of the department from NYPD at the time, I uh, just can't remember his name, uh, Joe something. I'll, I have pictures with him. Uh, he called for every police agency in the United States to start responding. He could, I know he spoke to Superintendent McMahon, and he says, uh, Superintendent says, how many troopers do you need? He said, all of them. So the superintendent immediately mustered a thousand troopers out to Stewart Field and started to uh, transition them down to the city. Um, the National Guard was activated that afternoon. To make a long story short, Jeff and I go in there and we were helping out. The second plane had just hit, so Calvin asked me to go and help coordinate the efforts in the second tower. So I go in the South Tower. <clears throat> the breeze still coming out of the building from the crash. Yeah, right. Um, on fire. People are jumping from the North Tower now in between the North and South Tower, <clears throat> some of them two and three, holding hands, you know, neckties with each other. And when they hit, it's just like a bomb. You know, it's like you're, you're in war again, you know. And uh, <clears throat> we go in the South Tower, and I meet with one of the fire chiefs there, uh, Joe Pfeiffer. And uh, I said, Joe, we're here to help. He goes, well, just, you know, get as many of you guys, direct people out of the buildings, out of the tunnels. He goes, I really need help in the tunnels there. So we had become friends over West Nile and stuff. And to other events, being I was the liaison from the governor to the Office of Emergency Management and one police plaza. 
anything that happened, I would get a phone call to respond to to give state assistance to the city. <clears throat> so uh, they open up an elevator and people aren't fired and they put them out with an extinguisher and Whoa. the firemen, I tell you, these firemen are, were unreal. And Jeff goes, you know, Captain, I'm, I don't know. I says, all right, so we'll go in a tunnel with the path trains and start evacuating people. <clears throat> With that, the uh, South Tower, about 20, 25 minutes later, collapses on us, and we're trapped in this tunnel area, about as big as this area right here, behind a big cement pillar. It was like 20 of us. <clears throat> so some firemen from Brooklyn Ladder Company find a hatch and break it out, and we crawl over some debris, and we get out this back hatch. Um, everybody in front of us, to the left of us, to the right of us, that were not behind the cement pillar were killed. We had to climb over them to get out. So I tell Jeff, because he was pretty shaken up, his girlfriend had been, happened to be on one of the trains that was coming into the Trade Center that we stopped. So I told him to go get her, find her, and just go muster our people at Stuyvesant High School. I go around the back of Building 7 to um, West Vesey and West where the North Tower is, All right. and I'm looking for any of my people, because I know I had a couple on the corner. But I found out later on they had dove into the garage area of the commodities exchange. Uh, so I'm at that corner, and a fireman comes running back out from by where West Rescue One was at, and he's yelling at me, it's coming down, it's coming down. I look up, and it's like the building's actually peeling apart, the webbing, I call it, the outside, and then yeah. it's imploding. But part of it went this way, this way, and this way, like a banana, like somebody took a banana. Right. You don't really see that in the movie, but when you're there standing, and it's like the sound of a thousand locomotives coming at you. So it gets down, this fireman grabs me on a race. We go over the, the all the fire trucks that you see on TV that are full of dust and they're imploded in the front. Right. That's from that tower coming down and imploding them. We go over the Jersey barrier, a girder goes over the top of this truck and us and it protects us. Chief Pfeiffer's over here with the French film crew. This is Vesey Street. All right. We're on west and here's the tower so we actually escaped that but the fireman had all kinds of stuff because his mask wasn't on tight he just put it on quick and all the debris went up and he couldn't breathe or anything so i got him into a Hatsola ambulance which is the jewish uh, uh amb volunteer ambulance in new york big big service they provide very good to what they do so i put him in there and then a doctor grabs me and he listens to my lungs he says no you got to go too i said all right doc i will so as they're pulling more firemen in and stuff that are really injured. I wasn't injured, you know. I had a, a, a. I found out I had two holes in my face here from, like acupuncture with steel, that took my teeth out. So I go down the side door and I go back out to ground zero. And there's this chief from SOD, Special Operations, Tom Patel, another Marine, you know, ball headed, <laughs> strapping. You know, he was in in the 80s. He comes over to me and we work details together. And he became the chief of emergency service in the city. Tom walks up to me and he gives me a hug. He goes, you all right, Cap? I said, yeah. I said, are you all right, Chief? He goes, yeah. He says, uh, you're bleeding. So he gives me a little rag for my face. You know, I had two little pinholes. That's what it was. But it took, I swallowed one of my teeth. I didn't know until later on. Really? Yeah. Jeez. It was kind of funny later when you think about it, you know. But uh, Tom grabs me, hugs me, gives me a kiss. And he goes, all right, uh, you're, you sure you're okay? And I'm shaking. He's shaking. I said, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, all right, enough bullshit. Let's get to work and get a command post going. So he and I started it all. You know, most of the command staff were dead. The police command staff were at the academy locked up under security because of the threats, because we thought more attacks were coming, and we couldn't lose that. Most of the firemen hierarchy that I had worked with over the years were dead. So we started that up, and to make a long story short, I spent 160 days there as the on-scene coordinator for the state and health and safety. Find out years later, my, as my health is deteriorating from 9-11, we lost 1,000 20 recovery, 22 recovery workers already since 9-11 from health issues related to 9-11. We're losing 20 to 25 a month right now. Jeez. As time goes on, we're going to lose more and more. Uh, so I, I would have bronchitis from November, October, November to March in New York. So we moved out here, and I've been a lot better. But my lungs are deteriorating so rapidly. Um, you know, they're taking good care of me. The VA is taking care of me, the World Trade Center Health Organization, so I have no complaints. So what I decided to do is I got a hold of them. You know, we have the Marine Corps League, which is a big organization, and the Marine Riders. We started the 911remembrance.org, 911unity.org, where we're having three days of celebration in Las Vegas, a motorcycle run, a bicycle run, a car show, a walk run, 
and a parade on the 11th that we invite every veteran to come to. And what time will that be? The parade will start at 5.46 in the morning, the same time the first plane hit the towers in New York. Lieutenant General Buck Bedard is our Grand Marshal who was in the Pentagon attack. He was the aide de camp to the Commandant at the time. Really? Yes. And uh, kind of get me with this, because between me and my two brothers, we lost a lot of friends in the towers, too. One of the girls I graduated with was the COO when the first tower came down. So, uh, don't try to make it out there that day. We're coming, we're coming down to the last minute. Jeff's telling me it's getting time. <clears throat> so, we'd love to have you there, Steph. You know that. Yeah, you're getting me with this one. I want to thank you for being on. I give you my chip. Thank you, sir. And, uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks for your service. Thank you as well. You know, and remember, uh, you have a story. I want to hear it. And uh, just like with Terry, uh, I'd like to come on the show. Give me a call at 513-2917. So until next week. Have a good uh, have a good weekend and simplify. Simplify. All right. Whoa.